to the Neurologic Wellness Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Joe, and today I am joined by my guest, Dr. Amanda Smith, as she discusses uh, female exercise physiology with us today. Thanks for joining us, uh, Dr. Smith. Thanks for having me, Joe. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Um, so, Dr. Smith, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're so passionate about this particular topic? Yeah, so this topic's like near and dear to my heart. Um, I practice in Atlanta and I see almost exclusively athletes and I have have a really strong interest in female athletes. Um, I've been an athlete my entire life. Uh, this is my first year competing as a professional cyclist. Um, I've competed in triathlons competitively and then I ran cross country and track in undergrad. Um, and uh, during undergrad, I had six stress fractures and I feel like they were managed really poorly by the medical world. And um, the thing that really helped me the most was going to a chiropractor. And of course I didn't go to a chiropractor until my final stress fracture. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that really kind of steered me um, on the path that I'm on right now and motivated me to learn even more about um, how female athletes are trained. Yeah. And I think that's been something that's becoming more and more identified as a problem is that you know, management of female versus male athletes or the research behind um, female and male athletes is pretty male dominated, right? Everything's kind of based on male physiology, where in reality, there's obviously a difference. Yeah, I actually have some statistics here um, that I think are that really motivated me. They actually really frustrated me, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. so, so Tokyo Olympics in 2020, actually 2021, was really when we first saw um, equal representation of male and females. Um, in Rio in 2016, it was still only 45 percent. And then Sydney in 2000 was only 38 percent. Mm -hmm. And the research has not caught up to that. Um, we uh, we have um, in uh, we have a study that's examined five thousand two hundred sixty one uh, is a meta analysis that's examined five thousand two hundred sixty one studies, and there was twelve point five million participants, um, and only thirty four percent of those overall uh, participants were women, and with six percent of those studies only focusing on women exclusively, whereas thirty one percent of those were studying men exclusively. And I just think that's really sad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, is the trend uh, getting better, though? Um, it doesn't seem like it. That study was in 2021, and they examined a study that was um, uh, another meta-analysis that was previous to that in 2014, and it didn't change much, um, which is even more frustrating. There's two females that I think are um, really kind of paving the way right now. Um, uh, Stacey Sims in, in New Zealand and then Georgie Brunvilles in the UK have been um, really crushing it with research. And that's who I've gotten a lot of my information from. But unfortunately, a lot of um, our research on how to train uh, is based off of a 150 pound white man. And um, that's not cool, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. There are definitely more people out there in the world than 150 pound white men. So, <laughs> so um, with uh so that being said what uh are some potential problems that may arise in the world of athletics um when we're using inappropriate data uh as our reference point well i, th I think the first one is just um the, the dogma uh behind training um there's been um, like like in 2010, we had women that were excluded. We had an event that was excluded from the Winter Olympics. Um, women's ski jumping uh, didn't happen until uh, Sochi in 2014, um, and it was it was the dumbest quote. Um, it, the uh, a guy that was the Secretary General of the International Ski Federation 
Um, he was quoted in an NPR interview saying that uh, ski jumping was inappropriate for women because their uterus might fall out uh, during landing in a ski jump. And this was in 2005 that that quote took place. Oh. And uh, I just think that's crazy, like to yeah. think about. <laughs> um, so first is, is the dogma behind um, training. And then um, return to play is very different for women to men. Um, we think about concussions and ACL tears and uh, things like that. Um, even like um, how to manage like ferritin levels and uh, it, it's different. And um, yeah. yeah. So um, can we touch on some of those physiological differences? Um, obviously, you know, there's the cyclical nature of um, a woman's physiology and how that may play into um, her her training given any a certain day right so. yeah so um specifically just the ones i touched on i'll, I'll highlight those um week two of or of or phase two i it's just a week two of the menstrual cycle is is the worst time or most susceptible time to get an acl tear and then the worst time to get a concussion mm -hmm. um but then training is uh, I, I really like the, um, to, to break down the menstrual phase, uh, or the menstrual cycle in like a, in a month. Um, nice. I think that's the easiest to understand. And then for training, um, if you do like three up weeks and a down week, it makes a lot of sense just to break it down that we, that, that way, because, uh, there's a week that you, you probably should just take it easy anyways, because you're ovulating and progesterone, um, really isn't good for anything except for making babies. So it doesn't really have any advantage for um, performance as far as exercise phys goes. Um, you said phase two? Um, phase two is the worst, the worst mm -hmm. time to get a concussion and the worst, and, and you're most susceptible to ACL tears. There's been a, a, a couple meta analysis that have been done, and that's the highest percent time to get a uh, ACL tear. Um, and it's because estrogen. Um, it creates this laxity in ligaments and tendons and makes them more susceptible for tears. So like ankle rolls and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. um, women are more susceptible, susceptible to ACL tears anyways, due to um, like Q angle and things mm -hmm. like that. So um, they're, they're even more susceptible during that time period. Mm -hmm. Right. And concussions tend to be a little worse during that time period as well, I believe. Yeah. Uh, or have longer lasting effects. Yeah. Um, progesterones, I, I did, I said it wasn't, I made it sound like it was worthless, but it is neuroprotective. So if you get a uh, concussion during the luteal phase, when progesterone is higher, mm -hmm. then you actually have, um, a, a quicker return to play than during the follicular phase when progesterone is low. Mm -hmm. So, so what are some considerations that doctors, coaches, trainers should have, uh, at the back of their mind, um, in terms of, uh, training these athletes? I think like knowing, um, knowing the hormone cycle really well, um, and knowing when is a good time to push, um, like training and when's a good time to rest. Um, and like, for example, like, um, weeks one and two are really good times to push, um, everything like you're like anything, like we have like really strong objective measures like, uh, HRV. Like I really like, uh, I just got a whoop recently and I really like it. Um, so your HRV is much higher in the follicular phase than in the luteal phase. Um, so you can, you can push higher, um, your hormones are lower than, um, versus week three, when progesterone is really high, um, your HRV is a lot lower, um, your resting heart rate's lower, your exercise heart rate's lower, your, or, sorry, higher, um, your breath rate's higher, your body temperature's higher, muscle breakdown is worse. Um, sweat response is worse. You retain, or um, so um, to just kind of talk about the menstrual cycle and like when training is optimal and when it's not. Um, I like to divide it up into like a monthly calendar. And the first week, um, when estrogen and progesterone are low and testosterone is also low, um, is is really the best time to train and to do like high intensity intervals. And it's, it's second best for uh, strength training. Um, the best for strength training is week two. Um, but during that week, um, it's interesting because it's also um, a time of uh, your immune, for if we talk about the immune system that we have higher levels of antibodies and increased inflammatory responses. So you're least susceptible to acute infection. 
um, but you're, it, it can be a worse time or a worsened, worsened time for chronic diseases um, for women that are susceptible to like autoimmune things. Um, you said this is the ovulation period? Um, no, so for uh, the, no, sorry, the, the follicular phase, follicular phase. Okay. is, um, is the, um, you're least susceptible to acute infection, but it can be mm -hmm. worse for chronic diseases because of uh, increased inflammation. Um, yeah, and then um, the follicular phase is also really good for um, to take tests and like any other like if you have like if you're an attorney and you might have like a big case coming up and like perhaps you can schedule it um, like it'd be better to schedule it for the follicular phase versus the luteal phase um, because progesterone uh, can interfere with like verbal ability and can make you forgetful and um, it's just not optimal. Um, so if you have a prefer or if you have a choice, you can you would choose that. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think an important thing to talk about is, is blood sugar, which changes um, with hormones, where with men, I don't think it changes as much, um, but women have a decreased appetite in the follicular phase um, as blood sugar is more stable then. Um, we also have a, a lower uh, basal metabolic rate and um, estrogen is, when estrogen's high, it's glycogen sparing. So we're more fat adapted then, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting if you apply that to uh, a competition that um, is, is more aerobic or more anaerobic, like depending on when, when you need to, to fuel for that, you have to be, I think you have to be mindful of those things. Um, and then moving on to the luteal phase, um, that the week three is probably the worst week to train. Like if you can choose to have an off week or a down week, that would be, that would be the week to do it. So, um, when estrogen and progesterone are high, um, you're going to require longer recovery, um, because your body really doesn't care if you have a competition or, um, a max VO2 workout or anything like that, or if you have to do like one rep max that, that week, um, your body only cares about getting pregnant and, um, allocating energy for that egg that, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, that week you have decreased peak power, um, decreased blood plasma volume, which increases CNS fatigue. Um, and, uh, you can have increased hunger that week due to like your supply, you're using those nutrients to, uh, allocate for that egg. Um, mm -hmm. and then your blood sugar is also not as stable then. So the, the carb and fat cravings occur, um, during that week. So right now it sounds like you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you said follicular phase would probably be a good week to do more endurance training, aerobic training. And then we want the luteal phase to be more of like active recovery or just complete recovery. Do you think, or yeah, like, like phase or uh, week three would would be like an off week for me like I try to program it that that's a down week or an off week and mm -hmm. and then um hit it hard um week one and two off mm -hmm. week three and then recover more in week four and you're able to um hit, hit like your numbers or your times that week because you had an off week the week before so are you taking week three completely off no, just, just a down week, just like decreasing okay. volume, decreasing intensity. Gotcha. So, um, and then migraines are more susceptible in when, when hormones change. So like when we get like a drop in estrogen or like an aggressive drop in a hormone, then we get like big changes. Like then that's when we get the migraines mm -hmm. and, um, like the major fatigue and things like that. So that, that makes sense, right? Like when you get a drastic change in hormones, like you're not going to feel right. Mm -hmm. um, and then estrogen is also linked to uh, serotonin and dopamine and a little bit of cortisol. So when estrogen changes, uh, serotonin and dopamine and cortisol are going to change. So you're naturally going to probably feel some um, anxiety or depression or just like feel different, feel funky that day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when it comes to those um, severe estrogen drops in patients with migraines, are there any, uh, tips or, uh, things you like to recommend, uh, to kind of relieve that drop? 
I, I haven't found anything, any studies that I really like that support um, like a supplement or anything to help mm-hmm. migraines. But I think, I think just knowing and just having the knowledge uh, is pretty liberating and knowing it like might be coming or knowing you might have a bad day um, and then you can kind of plan for it is, is really good. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So I think the coolest thing I found, um, which sometimes uh, you have to go back to evolutionary biology and then all things make sense then, um, is I actually found, so um, I said about that when you're ovulating, really the only good thing or the only thing you're good at is like really is getting it. Um, I found this really cool study called the stripper study about how strippers actually get paid more while they're ovulating. And then that led me down another rabbit hole of like how that works and why, and like, how are, how are men like sensing that like women are ovulating, you know? Um, and it, and it looked at, uh, pheromones and, um, stripper study and I thought wow man that's crazy like how does that work and so then I went down this other rabbit hole and I found the McClintock effect which is how um it kind of explained how women's hormones sync whenever they're hanging out like if you're on a team you kind of you've experienced that where you're kind of like you know you you kind of get your period the same day and stuff and it's based off uh, pheromones, which is kind of controversial in humans. Um, it's very well established in animals, which, um, is very interesting, but I think these phenomena still exist in humans. We just can't really explain it. Um, but it's, I thought that was interesting. And then I was learning about like teams and, um, how like athletes, that train, um, by their hormone cycles, which, which is a new thing. Like in 2019, the women's USA soccer team, um, uh, train that way. They like the way I was just describing how like week three, they kind of take it as a down week and they're careful. And then week two, they're really careful. They don't tear ACL or get a concussion. They're just like mindful of that stuff. And they did really well. Like they won that year. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. And then the Bowerman track club is actually doing that. I listened to a couple podcasts by Gwen Jorgensen, um, that she's talking about that. And, um, I think that's super cool that this is starting to be implemented, but we still just don't have a ton of research on it. So with the women's national team, that you mentioned, so so they were relying on the McClintock effect, right? You said it it sounds like it. I I couldn't find anything that was super detailed, like that Uh really like laid it out, but they said that they were like really mindful of that. And, um, uh, everyone was like off birth control, um, Mm -hmm. which is interesting because I also found studies that supported birth control that had, um, a protective, uh, effect against ACL and then against, um, uh, concussions that, um, is a little bit more favorable to be on birth control. You have uh, less likelihood to have, to sustain, um, a bad concussion or a bad ACL tear. Mm-hmm. Because birth control is essentially regulating the menstrual cycle in a way. Yeah, it, it regulates it, but it's not, there's not as many, um, like waves, like uh, we were mm-hmm. talking about how like you have a spike in estrogen and you have uh, the spike in progesterone where it's, it's a little more leveled out. So you don't have, uh, kind of those like cheat codes of like the days that you can really like hit it hard and you have the anabolic effect of estrogen. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you, your, your testosterone, your testosterone actually drops when you're on birth control. Mm-hmm. Um, and so does your cortisol levels, which we think of cortisol as a bad hormone, but, um, it's also the response of like good things. Like, um, you know, if there's a training stimulus, we want that boost in cortisol. Like it's, it's it's not always negative. Mm -hmm. And I know you recommended a book to me that I thought was really, really great, uh, called your brain on birth control and a lot of interesting things, uh, in that book. But, uh, essentially the takeaway is, you know, there's definitely a lot of, there's, a lot of pros and cons to being on birth control and it's it's good to be aware um how i guess you've mentioned a little bit on uh on um the things that uh, birth control can be can, can, can change i guess um when looking at uh, menstrual cycle um i mean what, what, what do you think as far as training better to be on better not to be on doesn't make a difference at the end of the day yeah there's doesn't seem to be as many highs as many lows when you're on birth control 
Um, and I don't want to speak too um, highly or, or terribly one way or the other about it, um, because the studies are pretty convincing um, upon the, you know, the invention of birth control. We had more women put into higher education and um, more women possibly in athletics. And there's certain women that like swear by it. They're like, there's no way I would be like upright right now. Um, like I have like terrible periods and like, I can't argue with that. Um, but there are a lot of negatives to it that I've, that I've read that like you don't get the boost in testosterone, your quarters, like your HPA axis is trashed, um, things like that. And then um, how um, they've done studies with um, males, how they like they, they can tell if women are on birth control or um, if they're like naturally um, menstruating, um, which that goes back to the pheromone thing, um, which I think, you know, that's one of those things that is like, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. It's, it's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 I personally don't have, I'm not decided one way or the other, you know, it's, it's, I think it's going to have to be one of those individual things. Mm -hmm. And it seems like um, the menstrual cycle is, is very individual, mm -hmm. um, but we're trying to draw conclusions so we can make um, you know, we can, we can have scientific studies and base research and training off of that. Yeah. 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 A lot more work needs to be done, obviously. Um, but a lot of fascinating topics to explore. So we've talked about, um, women during their regular menstrual cycle and the highs and lows of training with that. What happens if, um, then a woman becomes pregnant and still wants to train, what are some special considerations she needs to think about? Or maybe even um, uh, when she's lactating with a child, what, what does she need to consider with that? So as you can imagine, there's like we talked about, there's not a lot of research on like eumenorrheic women. Um, there's even less research on pregnant women who are high level athletes and uh, lactating women, um, which is, is again, upsetting. But um, I think the best thing I've, I've based like my clinical recommendations are on are on their hormone levels. So, um, if you look at hormone levels for, uh, pregnant women in like the first trimester versus, um, like a normal level, they, they, they start to skyrocket, right? Like, um, I'm looking at, um, estrogen levels, for example, in reproductive age female, um, during the ovulation spike, which estrogen and, um, uh, progesterone are really high. Um, so we have estrogen at 14 to 54 picograms per milliliter um, versus the first trimester of pregnancy, we have uh, 188 to 2,497 picograms per milliliter. And that's just the first trimester. And it climbs to 7,000 uh, picograms. So if you can imagine, we talked about how estrogen has this um, elastic property where it makes tendons and ligaments looser. Uh, if, if a woman is still deadlifting, and I actually just had this example that I had an, an athlete in the first or in the third trimester who she was doing max reps for, for deadlifting and she, uh, your, your like lockout point is going to be, um, extended more. Your back's going to be more extended because you have more elasticity. And she actually, um, gave herself a herniated disc and she has a retrolisthesis, um, and she believes it happened at that point. She didn't think it was like pre-existing or anything like that. She was like, no, it like happened that day. Mm -hmm. And she was like, well, if I would have known, you know, my estrogen levels were that high, like maybe I wouldn't have done that. And mm -hmm. I mean, who knows? Um, cause estrogen makes you more, um, confident and more competitive. So it also has that factor in it, but things like that, if you, I think back to like knowledge being like really liberating, being really powerful, and you can, you can kind of make your own, um, assumptions for that. I think that, Maybe, I mean, I, I personally, I don't know if I would have done a max, you know, max reps on deadlifts that day because my mm -hmm. estrogen skyrocketed, like. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you said like knowledge is power essentially. So, you know, you can make the decision, but as long as you, you have that information to make an educated decision on how you should train today based on where you're at um, and how your, your body is responding. So I think, yeah, that's, that's would be incredibly valuable. Yeah. And then um, when you're lactating, all your hormones are really low, right? So um, I think just recovering from birth and then the lack of sleep with a newborn is, is something that should be emphasized versus uh, the condition of like your body with like lots of estrogen in it. Something cool I read about um, postpartum men though. I don't know if you saw that um, once you're, once you have a kid, their estrogen actually decrease or their, sorry, their testosterone actually decreases by like 34%. Mm -hmm. 
I and thought that was that pretty actually, crazy. Yeah. yeah. Moving yeah. it back to the pheromones. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, become more, a little more paternal, probably. Yeah. Dr. Smith, this was so far incredibly informative. I just wanted to um, make sure to give you enough time to kind of let people know about you, where they can find you, how they can reach out to you uh, to learn more about uh, you know what it is you do in helping female athletes. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the Atlanta area. If you need anything, um, you can email me at drxsmithx at gmail.com. And you're in, uh, you said Atlanta. So uh, what's the name of your clinic? Radvocacy Wellness. And I'm also at Atlanta Sports Recovery Indicator. Nice. Yeah. So Dr. Smith is an expert in human physiology and recovery um especially knowledgeable in obviously female uh physiology and athletics as she demonstrated today so thank you for enlightening us on this uh topic that really does need more attention um you're really kind of leading the charge in our field so we appreciate that cool thank you so much you're welcome um and this has been your host from the neuro wellness podcast <laughs>